I'm going to try to provide you a, with sort of my perspective on where things are in terms of the cure agenda and what our agenda is in San Francisco. Um, I run uh, with Lewis Picker a large collaboratory, one of the Delaney collaboratories, and the goal of that group, and I'm going to talk a lot about our data in, in a second, um, is to use, is to manipulate the host immune system to generate durable control. And the premise of all our work is based on the observations that you all have made, we all have made, in controllers, post-treatment controllers, and, and increasingly in these monkeys that have been cured in various NHP studies, that in order to achieve this desired outcome, we need a low reservoir size, uh, we need an effective and durable host response, and I believe we need low inflammation, and apparently so does Eve, because he made a big point of that in his, in his nice talk today. Um, and, uh, and Eve mentioned that there is 70-some clinical trials out there right now um, looking at these various issues with treatment interruptions. There's many more without treatment interruptions. This is just sort of um, a list of the studies that we are doing in San Francisco focusing on trying to manipulate the host immune system so that we get better T cells that are durable and sustained. Um, and we have a bunch of studies, some that are fully enrolled, uh, some that are coming to the clinic, including one with collaboration with Barbara um, and George here. Um, and I'm not going to go into this, because um, bottom line is we don't really have much data, um, and I only think this is one part of the story that we've been talking about a lot here. I'm throwing this up here just to give people an idea that what's going on, and also to acknowledge those of you working in the prevention field that um, we appreciate all the work you've done because we're primarily using your tools uh, to explore how to go about doing this in a therapeutic setting. But the questions I want to ask are the other ones. Can we reduce the reservoir during ARP? And can we reduce the inflammatory environment? And the assumption that has been made by our group is that if we really understand why HIV persists during long-term ARP, where the cells are, how it's changing over time, um, then we can design therapeutic interventions to sort of basically reduce the reservoir and hopefully at the same time enhance the capacity of the immune system to work better. So why does HIV persist during ARP? Um, there may be ongoing virus replication. There may be these sanctuaries, but the dominant factor that's contributing to, to HIV persistence is, of course, this concept of T cell proliferation, um, whether it's driven by antigen or cytokines, no one knows, but there have been dozens and dozens of paper now which have con that basically have shown that this proliferative capacity of memory T cells, not a surprise, are the primary reason why the HIV persists during long-term ARP. There are a handful of papers, including some data from our group, that this is driven in part by the fact that the HIV genome is integrating uh, um, at least those cells that are proliferating and, and persisting, that, they're, um, that the integration sites are associated with, with cancer and cell growth genes. Um, so what I'm about to talk about uh, over the next uh, dozen or so slides is um, probably right. Um, probably not entirely right. Um, I would say maybe 90% is correct. I'm not sure which 10% is wrong. Um, but it's my best summary of where the field is in terms of the nature of the reservoir during early and particularly late ARP. So what do we know? So um, my uh, colleagues in San Francisco um, have done this beautiful study um, looking at, uh, called the HOPE study, in which we took 24 HIV-infected individuals and we labeled them with deuterium and we measured directly in vivo the turnover rights of CD4 positive T cells. And we also at the same time looked at the proportion of these cells that contain integrated HIV DNA. And as shown here, you can see that, um, that there appears during short-term and long-term ART uh, integration of HIV DNA in these shorter-lived cells, transitional memory cells, and the effector memory cells. Um, and when we actually directly quantified the proliferation of these cells, indeed, these cells which contained mostly integrated DNA were, in fact, actually had much shorter half-lives, were being replaced much more rapidly, had a higher proliferation rate, as one might expect. And if you look at the relationship between cell half-life um, and the size of the reservoir, you see this very negative correlation. So this is all consistent with the fact that, yes, indeed, um, during treatment, there is a relationship between the frequency of cells proliferating 
and the size of the reservoir. Um, and when you look um, uh, within the subsets, you can see uh, here that the proportion, the contribution that clonal expansions contribute to the reservoir within each of these subsets is much greater in those cells which are rapidly turning over, which is probably not too surprising. And in subsequent work done by Sharon Lewin's group, when you dig down a little bit deeper, particularly in these effector memory cells, we see these massive expansions. And in those types of expansions, we see evidence of, of enrichment for these integration sites being basically associated with these oncogenes, cancer genes, cell growth genes. All consistent with this sort of basic theory that I'm building up here. Um, working in the same cohort with a different part of the DARE collaboratory, Sarah Palmer's group more or less found the same thing when she used her assay, which she actually uses full genome sequencing, the FLIPS assay, and she found during treatment, and again, this is more notable during long-term ART than short-term ART, that the um, intact genomes are, in, are enriched in these cells which have an effector memory phenotype and or express HLA-DR, a, a measure of T-cell proliferation. Um, again, in the same group and often in the same cohort by the same people over the past several years, um, and Matthew mentioned some of this in his talk, we see strong evidence. Well, the evidence is strong for the effect, but the effect is relatively modest, but we see evidence that HIV is enriched in PD-1 expressing cells and that by blocking PD-1 in vitro, we can, exp we can get um, HIV expression uh, to be much stronger. And in fact, we see this also in the cancer studies. These are studies from Tom Udruk, again working with the DARE Collaboratory, where he showed um, that among HIV-infected people on long-term ART who have cancer and who are receiving pembrolizumab, a PD-1 blockade, that if you look immediately after the dose, you see evidence that's significant not universal for increased amount of HIV RNA and plasma RNA being produced, consistent with the fact that the PD-1 expressing cells are enriched for HIV and blocking that pathway causes its release. Um, so this is all more or less cross-sectional data, um, and the question then becomes, and, and these individuals that participate in these studies sort of varied from early art to late art. The next question that I want to address with you is whether or not there is change over a period of 10, 15, 20 years in terms of where this reservoir lives. We think there is. Um, first of all, in a study that we did with uh, Bob Silicano, shown here. So Bob has this assay that was just published in the left-hand corner there called the IPTA assay. Um, which is basically this way that he estimates the proportion of cells that contain intact genomes. Um, um, when we applied this assay um, to, a, to our cohort and we looked at what happens to the intact genomes versus the defective ones over a period of a decade or so, uh, we found strong evidence that the intact genomes decreased at a rate that was uh, more rapid than the defective genomes. But, that's a, that, but this effect occurred primarily during the first several years of ARP. Um, and when we looked in lymph nodes, again within the same cohort, and this is work done by Nicholas Schumann's group, we also sat, found, found evidence of a decline in the size of the reservoir, the active reservoir uh, in uh, lymph nodes, again over with the decline being relatively slow, but eventually significant and taking several years to play out. Now this figure is quite remarkably similar to work that Matthew and Jeppe and um, and their team published in this beautiful paper a couple years ago in which they showed more or less the same thing, that the frequency of um, uh, infected cells uh, within the lymph nodes declined over a period of several years. And importantly, they found that this was associated with decline in the, in the size and the distribution and the robustness of the germinal centers, suggesting that over long periods of time, as the inflammatory environment in the lymph nodes improves, these germinal centers disappear and this enrichment in these TFA cells goes down. And this time course more or less um, correlates with the decline in HIV DNA that we observed uh, in lymph nodes as well in blood. 
So um, again, suggesting that uh, the reservoir is not quite as stable as we initially thought. Um, going back to this work with Sarah Palmer, with the FLIPS assay, um, again, looking over a period now of several years uh, within individuals uh, with this FLIPS assay, we find, again, the same evidence that this concept that there is enrichment of the virus in proliferating cells, particularly effector memory cells that have a high replacement rate, increases over a period of many, many years. Um, and in data which I um, don't have time to go into, but I think is very relevant and I can come back to in my last slide and perhaps we can discuss. Uh, in a number of studies, some in vivo, some in vitro, um, when you look again at what's happening with the nature of the reservoir in terms of where it lives, where it's integrated, and how easy it is to reverse, that there is a general trend, and this, this is my most controversial slide, there is a general trend that, again, over periods of many, many years during long-term art, the intact genomes that persist are increasingly located in areas of the genome in which, the, which are silent uh, or are basically viruses which are much more difficult to reactivate ex vivo. This is consistent with this whole concept that latency um, is a dynamic situation. Some viruses are easy to reverse and some are not, but during long-term art, you were enriching for these reservoir, these genomes, which are increasingly hard to activate, and they're entering perhaps into a state of permanent residency. So to summarize that, oh, and one last point that I wanna make before I jump into our clinical trial that we did based on all this, uh, an important point to make is that um, when we have done studies and others have looked in lymph nodes for inflammation, granted generally in people who have not been to ARP for many, many years, uh, here using imaging modalities, but there are many ways of doing it, there is evidence of persistent inflammation at the cellular level and the tissue level uh, in lymph nodes during long-term ARP. Okay, so let me just summarize all that. Um, so if you... Um, if you take an unbiased, and I'm pretty neutral uh, in this story, um, I, just, um, I just provide the blood and tissue and let other people figure out what's going on and collect all the data and tell these stories. Uh, it's my sense from the work that we're doing in our DARE collaboratory and in the rest of the, rest of the field that um, during long-term treatment, HIV is increasingly enriched in these differentially rapidly turning over cells that express PD-1, HLA-DR, perhaps CFH markers, but basically that one population that I focused in on. Importantly, during, again, long-term treatment, we're talking 10, 20, 15 years now, um, increasingly the population is in that cell and the virus population that we observe there is often massively clonally expanded. Um, and that in general, what is seen in the first couple years of art in people, and I'm assuming in monkeys, would not be the same as what you're going to observe in 10 to 20 years. And that after 10 or so years, the reservoir is, is, has undergone um, a shrinkage. Um, a lot of the singlets have disappeared. Uh, it's becoming more clonal um, and possibly becoming more and more difficult to reactivate. So based on all this, we ask the question, if the reservoir is preferentially maintained in cells that are rapidly turning over, have these high replacement rates, then would a sustained inhibition of the proliferation therapeutically lead to a measurable and sustained decline in the size of the reservoir? And many of the, many of the interventions that one might look at that would do this also have an anti-inflammatory effect which might address other problems that we observe during long-term treatment. So what did we do? So several years ago, I was working with Peter Stock in the transplant population, and we observed, um, and we had a very different hypothesis at the time, to be honest, but we did this exploratory study where we looked at people who'd gotten a transplant and received uh, various different immunosuppressive therapy to prevent rejection, 
and one group actually received serolimus or rapamycin, an mTOR inhibitor, and we observed cross-sectionally in this cohort, which was a pretty sloppy cohort with a very sloppy assay, so take it for what it's worth, but we observed evidence that the, um, that the reservoir size was basically lower in individuals who were receiving serolimus, which is a drug that is known and we subsequently shown in these monkey studies, and these are monkey studies done by Lewis Picker's group with Jeff Lifson and Afam and Romas and, and, and their team, again working within the Derrick Laboratory, they found that these mTOR inhibitors, particularly serolimus or rapamycin, can induce a um, measurable, perhaps um, potent reduction in the proportion of these cells that are CD4 positive and proliferating. Um, a, a story which is consistent with what's seen in the cancer world as well. So, based on that, um, we did a study, uh, ACTG 5337, where we took a group of HIV-infected individuals on long-term ART, and we brought them in, um, and uh, we observed, uh, we, we did a baseline evaluation, and we observed what happened over time. Uh, and then we gave them uh, up to 20 weeks of serolimus at relatively low doses that were basically defined by therapeutic levels. And we did a fair amount of immunology and virology, and we found, uh, as expected, a modest decrease in the proportion of CD4 cells expressing KI67, a marker of cell proliferation. And we also observed significant changes as well in expression of CCR5, KI67, and PD1. Uh, in the CD8 T cell population, which was also expected. So the question then, did all of this actually reduce the size of the reservoir, which was our primary interest? And the answer to that is uh, yes, but the effect was modest at best. Um, so um, this is uh, uh, the HIV DNA levels. We haven't done sor sorting yet, and we haven't actually applied the IPTA assay to this. All that stuff is going on. But in terms of just the frequent cells expressing DNA, we saw a, um, a, a small decrease, but it was consistent with the hypothesis. It's one of the rare clinical trials. Trust me, I've been there. We've done a lot of clinical trials in which we tried to budge the DNA levels. Um, and sometimes you see these anecdotes, um, but this is one of the first studies that have shown this um, with a significant p-value. Um, uh, and the effect appeared to be sustained, as we had hoped, after the mTOR inhibitors were, were re, 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 um, interrupted. So this is generally consistent with this hypothesis that you can, um, if affect this proliferating cell population uh, and alter the size of the reservoir, clearly you're not going to cure anyone with this way, but I think it's going to give us signals into the pathogenesis of how HIV persists and perhaps come up with better ways to achieve this type of outcome. Um, finally. Eric Verdon and his group, uh, in the paper here listed in the left-hand corner, had a, had a study done in cell where he specifically looked at the role of various different pathways, including mTOR, to identify those that are associated with either RNA expression or deep, deep latency. And he was looking for new ways to do the so-called um, block and lock effect where basically you want to shut down RNA expression to such a degree that you, you enter into the state of permanent latency. This idea has been worked out in mice and now in monkeys with TAT inhibitors, but it hasn't really been tested in people. Um, it wasn't a primary focus of the study. In fact, we didn't really look at it very much in the serolimus study. This is a second study we did with Everlimus, which is a more pure mTOR inhibitor, and in this study, uh, we found evidence that by blocking mTOR, uh, we also um, reduced the expression of HIV RNA, which is broadly consistent with this concept um, of, of basically block and lock. Whether or not it's reversible is not something we could have tested in this particular study, but we are quite interested in this pathway and in this um, potential approach to dealing with the reservoir. So my conclusions during long-term are. Um, it's my perspective that, again, 10, 20 years of treatment looks quite different than one to two years of treatment, and 10 to 20 years of treatment, you have a virus population which is increasingly clonal, uh, perhaps harder to activate, 
um, more in these proliferating cells, uh, and so forth. Um, and that uh, for those of us interested in this whole concept of what we call reducing control, you know, reduce the reservoir and control what's left, um, this perhaps is one, one approach, uh, reducing proliferation, altering um, uh, activation of the, of the reservoir uh, as a potential way to do these combination studies with enhanced capacity to generate T cell responses. Um, questions that remain, can we do better? Is the effect that we're seeing actually sustained? Um, and would other drugs work? And there are actually two drugs that we've tested in studies already that th these clinical trials have been finished, one with I1 beta and one with JAK SAT inhibitors. The first one was done as a pilot study at UCSF, and the second one was an ACTG study. And again, we had this very focused interest in whether or not using these pathways can affect RNA production in the way that we decided um, and, and talked about. And with that, thank you very much.